farming is very different depending on where you are and has changed significantly over the centuries, so much so that creatures we now consider pests could have been highly regarded in the past. From the number one enemy of every farmer to the most seemingly insignificant yet crucially important little critter, here are the 20 rarest animals used in farming. Number 20. Llamas and Alpacas Llamas and alpacas are camelids just like camels and dromedaries and are also the largest domesticated animal in South America. And just like quadrupeds, which are animals that walk on four legs, think of horses or bulls for instance, in Europe and Asia, llamas and alpacas play a central and crucial role in the economic, social, and ritual lives of past South American civilizations. South American camelids formed a valuable source of resources. Its meat was consumed fresh or prepared. With their wool, they made threads and fabrics. Their bones, leather, fat, and excrement had various applications as well, such as musical instruments, footwear, medicine, and fertilizer, respectively. They were also preferred animals for religious sacrifices. The communal herds of camelids were cared for by youngsters, whose ages fluctuated between 12 and 16 years old. In areas where communal herds were large, such as the High Plateau region, where pastures were far away, it's likely that their care was in the hands of a full-time specialist. Chroniclers mention two Quechua names for shepherds, Lama Michi, which was associated with low social status, and Lama Cameos, which designated the Lama keeper or employee responsible for the herds. The state shepherds were responsible for the animals that were in their charge, whose accounting and supervision were done by officials appointed by the state. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Now, it's time for the star topic. Evidence has recently surfaced that suggests that in Russia during the Middle Ages, some people used trained bears to help them around the farm. And if you think about it, you won't find a stronger, more hardworking animal than a bear, with the bonus that no predator's gonna dare step foot anywhere near your farm, let alone an angry neighbor. I think it's a genius idea. They started suspecting this when a group of archaeologists found a muzzle that was far too big to have belonged to any type of dog or wolf. After further investigation, they started finding in all sorts of items that could have been used for bears that until now nobody could explain. Comment down below with the hashtag StarTopic and let us know your opinion in relation to what we just showed on screen. With that said, let's keep things moving. Number 19. Barn Owls Owls are different from all other birds of prey. They are primarily nocturnal and have a highly developed sense of hearing and large eyes to aid their night vision. Their facial feathers are shaped to funnel sound directly to their ears, and their wing feathers have special ridges to carry out their silent flight. Owls feed on rodents and are extremely efficient at keeping rodent numbers down, which is beneficial to farmers. In other words, barn owls are rodent-killing machines. And the best part? It costs next to nothing, and it doesn't pollute the earth. What else could you ask for? Barn owls are becoming increasingly common for rodent control on farms. They are more efficient hunters than cats and more effective than traps, and poison isn't an option for organic and green farming operations. Owls do not build a nest, a fact that's made it easy for farmers to attract them to certain areas. Farmers build owl barn nest boxes and set them up near the fields where they want the owls to hunt. Wine growers in California have found them to be particularly useful in the control of rats and moles. Also, they look super cool and are simply majestic creatures. Number 18. Herdwick Herdwick sheep are quite distinctive with their shaggy gray coats and expressive faces. All in all, they are hard to miss, and if you ever happen to spend time in the Lake District of the UK, you will almost certainly spot them nonchalantly grazing on the high fells and in fields down in the valleys. Thing is, though, you'll probably not see them anywhere else in the country, as 99% of Herdwick sheep are in the Lake District. 
This type of sheep is believed to have been introduced to the area by Viking invaders around the 10th or 11th centuries, although the exact origin is unsure. By the end of the 12th century, this breed became not only one of the most important breeds of sheep in the area, but the only one. They evidently took well to their new home, and the local farmers were delighted. Herdwick sheep are all born with black faces, black legs, and almost black fleeces. If anyone tries to steal one, these little fellas have a homing instinct and will return diligently to their native pasture if they're moved. So they're even thief-proof. They're a quite hardy breed, how could they not be, having lived with Vikings, right? Which makes them perfect to endure the harsh weather of Lake District. They are the most perfect foreign species British farmers could ask for. Number 17. Wild Boar if you ever visit the Nordic country of Finland and you see a wild boar on the menu of a restaurant, you know that you are at a very luxurious establishment, as wild boar is considered a delicacy there. In fact, Finnish people go so crazy about wild boar meat that many farmers have started to farm the creatures for the sole purpose of selling the meat to the culinary industry. However, even though the country is finally free from African swine fever, the dangerous virus is still active in Russia, which is relatively close by, so farmers need to keep constant vigilance which is extremely time-consuming, making this delicacy all the more special. The wild boar adapts to all types of environments as long as it has the necessary food and water to quench its thirst and mud baths. It is a fearful animal and hides at the slightest noise. It has nocturnal habits. They move from one place to another only at night. Its wide initial distribution range was Eurasia and North Africa, which resulted in many populations currently showing great variability in size and morphology. This is how we can find it natively from Ireland to Japan and from Egypt to Siberia, but currently it occurs natively or introduced on all continents except Antarctica and on some islands, being one of the land mammals with the largest geographical dispersion. Number 16. Cats most people nowadays think of cats as cute and aloof pets to keep you company, but that wasn't always the case. Cats once had a job to do if they wanted to be in humanity's good graces. Although, by looking at them today, it would seem they completely forgot about that. Six million years ago, after a long evolutionary process, the first cat emerged. Some studies have determined that they all come from a subspecies of wild cat from the Middle East, the Felis silvestris libica. 10,000 years ago, during the Neolithic, after dating the age of a tomb in Cyprus in which the first remains of a cat appear to be 9,500 years old, it's postulated that the domestication of the animal must have begun in the Fertile Crescent some 10,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago, it's believed that domestication itself, with the acceptance of cats in houses as pets, occurred in Egypt when their role in the control of rodents and dangerous snakes was valued. The cat then begins to be a part of the lives of humans. 2,500 years ago in Egypt, it is given a sacred character and is worshipped. Cats are offered as an offering to the gods, especially to Bastet, first a goddess with the head of a lion and then with the head of a cat. The demand for these felines caused them to start breeding, multiplying their population by millions. Number 15. Boxer and Benjamin Animal Farm by George Orwell Animal Farm demonstrates how the inability or unwillingness to challenge authority censures the working class to tolerate the full extent of ruling class oppression. One of Orwell's central concerns, both in Animal Farm and in 1984, is the way in which language can be used as a tool of control. In Animal Farm, the pigs progressively change and form the idea of the socialist revolution to argue their behavior and watch over the other animals in the dark. The main motto of the farm can be clearly highlighted as all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. This outrageous infamy of the word equal and of the vision of equality generally characterizes the regime of the pigs, which becomes increasingly bold as the novel progresses. The horse, whose incredible strength, dedication, and nobility play a key role in the early happiness of Animal Farm and the subsequent consummation of the windmill, is Boxer. He is a beloved character, quick to help, but very slow. Boxer shows much devotion to Animal Farm's ideals, but little ability to think of them independently. He innocently trusts the pigs to make all his decisions for him. His two mottos are, I will work harder, and Napoleon is always right. Number 14. The Roosters 
Roosters are known for being obnoxious and annoying alarm clocks with wings that always wake you up way too early, especially on the weekends. But sadly, the lives of roosters and chickens are nothing short of hell on earth. When we consider how companion animals are treated and compare it to how those raised for meat, eggs, and dairy are treated, the difference is abysmal and honestly quite traumatizing. Paul Farmer once said, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong in this world. And this especially applies to the unfortunate animals born into a life of misery and confinement on factory farms. In the US alone, 9 billion chickens are cruelly slaughtered each year for meat, and 305 million hens are used in egg production. These birds will live their lives in horrific conditions, cramped in tight spaces, denied of their basic freedom or the ability to exhibit their natural instincts. Male chicks are instantly, violently killed because they are deemed useless. They don't turn a profit. Adult roosters are regarded as insignificant and worthless, and they're running out of ways of getting rid of them. Truly sad. Number 13. Camel Camels are animals of desert origin and whose exact origin remains an enigma and hidden to this day, along with the beginning of their domestication. The name of the camel derives from the Hebrew gamel, and its meaning can be translated as return and compensation. Since the beginning of human civilizations, man managed to domesticate this animal and knew what purpose to give it. They noticed its great carrying capacity and its extreme resistance to the hostile conditions of the desert. According to clear characteristics, two classes of camel can be mentioned the camels as is, and the dromedaries. The camel is an animal better adapted to the night cold of the desert and has less resistance in terms of carrying capacity and distance travel. It's distinguished by having two humps and a greater amount of fur, which is useful in the textile industry to manufacture a variety of garments. Regarding their diet, camels in general belong to the group of ruminants, which are animals that use two stages to ingest their food. First, they chew and swallow it, and later they return it to chew and degrade it again. The second part is called rumination. The camel's feet are designed to not sink into the sand and ensure a brisk ride that isn't hampered by difficult terrain. Number 12. Longhorn this iconic breed of cattle has become, in a way, the quintessential image of old-school Texas ranches. But did you know that they originally come from Craven in the north of England? They appeared around the 17th century and instantly became a hit. Their large body mass and strength meant that they were perfect as working cattle used for pulling machinery, and yet their beef and milk were also delicious. The best of both worlds. And don't be scared by their gigantic horns from which they get their name, this breed of cattle is usually super friendly. Today, the Longhorn breed is still used as a beef stock. However, many Texas ranchers keep herds purely because of their link to Texas history, and probably because they look insanely cool. In other parts of North America, this breed is used for much more. This breed has a strong survival instinct and can find food and shelter during times of rough weather. I'm sure farmers appreciate having such independent and assertive cattle. They also breed for a long time, well into their teens, which is always a big plus. In fact, there have been Longhorn cows that have bred for up to 30 years, and apparently they make the best mothers. They've gotten so good at hiding their calves from predators that sometimes even the ranchers have a hard time getting to them. Number 11. Icelandic Horse it was more than a thousand years ago when the first settlers arrived in this country. It is incredible that from the 9th century to the present 21st century, such a nice animal survived practically without any changes. The Icelandic horse has been the best friend and the best servant ever since, and it was largely thanks to them that the first Icelanders survived the harsh climactic conditions of the island of fire and ice. It has been more than 900 years since the wise people of Iceland prohibited the importation of any horse from other countries and thus ensured the pure breed of the Icelandic horse. Today, the number of horses in Iceland stands at about 80,000, and they can be seen grazing freely throughout the entire Icelandic geography. People adore them for their personality and for their exceptional qualities. Its stature is small, but it's a very strong horse. It measures 53 inches in height and is very affectionate. Icelandic horses are very gentle, calm, and brave. They have five ways of walking, and one of them is only unique to this species. It 
is called the tolt. Tolt is a very special form of running. The rider barely moves. It is the most comfortable way to ride a horse. The Icelanders say that you can bring a cup of coffee and you won't waste a drop because riding the horse in tolt is like being on the sofa with all the comforts of home. Now they just gotta find out how to mount a TV on one. Number 10. Skunks. For those watching this video that have ever been sprayed by a skunk, you know it's a grade horrible. So much so that nobody wants to be anywhere near the creatures, and children usually run away as soon as they spot one in the wild. But these black and white stinky little critters can actually bring massive benefits to farms. For starters, most of their diet includes a vast amount of insect pests which plague the nightmares of any farmer. So you know, a little bit of an occasional bad scent is a good deal, I guess. They also eat berries, leaves, and grasses, which keeps the crops nice and clean. On the other hand, they can be quite aggressive when they feel their young are being threatened, and skunks do carry all sorts of nasty diseases that you don't want anywhere near you. Uh, and if you ask a beekeeper, they are quite passionately in constant conflict with skunks. Apparently, their fur is thick enough to be unbothered by bee stings, and skunks quite famously enjoy their daily sugar dose, so they'll have no issue in walking right up to a bee colony and stealing their honey. Not very polite if you ask me. Number 9. Zebu. The zebus, which zoologists up to now consider as belonging to the only species of B. indicus, are only distinguished from the taurine bovids by the hump they have on the withers. Their skeleton is not in any way altered by this peculiarity, contrary to what happens with bison. The hump is made up of nothing more than a deposit of fat. Starting in 1848, zebu cattle began to be introduced into the United States, first from India, then from Brazil, and some from South Africa. The Nelore, Guzara, Gir, and several other breeds were imported. All of these breeds are amalgamated under the generic designation of Brahmin, which was later officially accepted by the Department of Agriculture. In the records that were opened, the entry of animals was also allowed that, having had British blood, were continuously served by imported bulls and were no less than 15 sixteenths zebu blood. Initially, the Guzera blood predominated, but later the Nelore intensified. This explains why in the U.S. there's only one Brahmin breed, and that Brahmin and zebu are synonymous. That is to say, the name of Brahmin is applied in the USA indistinctly to no more than 30 zebu breeds crossed and selected to a certain type. Zebus have great muscular development, especially in their hindquarters. The ears are large and pendulous, which differentiates it at first glance from the Nelore. Number 8. Ferret it was domesticated at least 2,500 years ago to hunt rabbits. The first archaeological finds of ferrets date back to 1500 BC, although it's not known for sure when it began to be domesticated. Domestication is believed to have been similar to that of the cat. Some say that the ancient Egyptians had ferrets, but it's more likely that Europeans visiting Egypt saw cats and thought that using a small carnivore to protect grain reserves was a great idea. Since no mummified ferrets or hieroglyphs have been found to represent them, this theory has little foundation. Around the year 6 BC, Emperor Caesar Augustus sent ferrets or mongooses to the Balearic Islands to control rabbit infestations. The ferret is probably descended from the polecat, which is why the most widely used scientific name for this animal is Mustela putorius furo. For hundreds of years, the main use of ferrets was hunting rabbits. With their long, slender bodies, they are well adapted to entering burrows and hunting the animals inside. They are still used for hunting in some countries, especially in Australia, where rabbits are are a plague, and despite modern technology, the combination of a few nets and a couple of ferrets is very effective. In Spain, the use of ferrets for hunting is regulated in each autonomous community, although the majority, such as the Balearic Islands, prohibit its use by law. Other communities, despite prohibiting hunting with ferrets, allow it to be done if a permit is obtained from the ministry, because it is recognized that there's a plague of rabbits. Number 7. Silkworm. The silkworm is a species of Lepidopteran insect of the Bombycidae family. It was domesticated from the wild Bombyx mandarin moth, which ranges from northern India to northern China, Korea, Japan, and the easternmost regions of Russia. The domestic silkworm comes from wild Chinese moths. Today, it's raised in many regions of the world to take advantage of the cocoon that protects its chrysalis, made up of an extensive silk filament produced by the caterpillar when it retracts for metamorphosis. Although there are other species, be more 
is the most widespread, and it's commonly known as the silkworm. The eggs are between one and one and a half millimeters long. Unfertilized eggs are immediately distinguished by maintaining a yellowish coloration. Dark grays are normal, and if they have a greenish color, they will soon hatch. The larva uses the starch from the mulberry leaves that it's consumed, and it transforms into dextrin by its metabolism to produce silk thread. The apparatus designed for this purpose is composed of two glands located below the digestive tract, whose ducts lead to the row located in the 11th ring. The material liquid inside the body solidifies in contact with the air. Turning on itself, it makes an oval shell around its body made up of a single thread up to 1,500 meters long. The process takes two or three days. The complete emptying of the silk glands incites pupation, which lasts about 20 days under normal conditions, after which a new butterfly emerges. Number 6. Dove. The ancestor of all domestic pigeons is a bird that, if we live in the city, we will very possibly have seen. The ancestor of domestic pigeons is the rock pigeon, with the scientific name Columba Livia, whose physical appearance is approximately the same as that of our urban pigeons. Although the exact time is unknown, it's believed that the domestication of the pigeon took place more than 5,000 years ago in the Middle East in what is now Iran, from wild specimens of the rock pigeon, or Columba Livia. Today, pigeons are studied to understand the mechanics of flight. Traditionally, pigeons have been used as a means of transport to send documents over long distances, taking advantage of the movement behavior between the feeding and breeding places of this species, although the wild or feral populations are usually sedentary. In the past, their droppings were also quite valuable. They used them for fertilizer and also for leather tanning and even for making gunpowder. Currently, carrier pigeons are usually raised at the amateur level in pigeon racing, replaced by technological mail. These birds are also bred for meat and as laboratory animals in studies of flight mechanics and genetics, among others. Number 5. B. According to an extensive international study, human beings have been practicing beekeeping for at least 9,000 years. Traces of wax have been found in numerous Neolithic pottery fragments from Anatolia, Europe, and North Africa, suggesting that the exploitation of the honeybee Apis mellifera occurred practically since the birth of agriculture and livestock. The oldest trace has been recorded at a Turkish site and dates back to around 7000 BC. The problem with studying the association between bees and humans is that insects don't leave fossil traces. But since wax, the undoubted product of beekeeping, is a stable compound, researchers have been able to trace its presence in 6,400 pottery fragments belonging to 150 sites. This has confirmed the ancient relationship between Apis Mellifera and Homo sapiens, which previously could only be deduced from artistic representations in prehistoric caves and Egyptian murals. Experts believe that the first reason to develop beekeeping was to produce honey, a sweetener in all probability highly appreciated in prehistory. As for the wax, it would surely have had multiple uses, from waterproofing ceramic containers to its medicinal, cosmetic, or ceremonial application. Number 4. Ox. The origin of this animal dates back to time immemorial. Already in ancient Egypt, it was used for agricultural tasks as food and as a reason for religious worship by the god Apis, represented as a bull or a man with a bull's head. Apis was the god of the sun, fertility, and later funerary. This liturgy later passed to ancient Greece, which in the early days sacrificed bulls whose heads had not yet carried the yoke. In the early days of the Roman Empire, oxen for agriculture were not killed. Cattle did not exist in America until the introduction of the first domestic animals after European colonization. It was in the year 1521 when their arrival on the mainland began, which, after a process of evolution, generated a great diversity of breeds adapted to the new environment. But what exactly is an ox? Well, it is a sterile adult male bovine, or a bull, since it's castrated once it's reached sexual maturity to lower its testosterone levels and make it more docile and manageable for its productive function, agricultural load tasks. This castration is carried out in the first months of life, seeing as if it's done after the ox is a year old, it can suffer high levels of stress and even cause death. Number 3. Earthworms 
Earthworms are one of the most important organisms in the soil, especially in productive ecosystems, due to their influence on the composition of organic matter, development of soil structure, and nutrient cycling. Along with ants and beetle larvae, earthworms are the cause of physical modifications in the soil, modifying the environment for other organisms and altering the availability of food for plants. They constitute part of the animal biomass of soils and are usually present in low acid and high quality soils. The current crisis in agriculture owes its origin to the accelerated loss of organic matter content and soil degradation, which in turn is caused by the destruction of the fauna present in the soil, such as earthworms. Among other benefits, they stand out for facilitating the rupture and mineralization of surface debris and for incorporating surface debris into the deep layers, bringing the soil that is deeper to the surface. In addition, they feed on fragments of organic matter and mix it with the mineral part of the soil surface. The activity of earthworms in agricultural soils accelerates the decomposition of plant debris, increasing the rate of nutrient transformation, promotes soil aggregation and porosity, increases water infiltration and solute transport. They also increase carbon mineralization in the soil. Number 2. Egret Aside from being very graceful and delicate, these birds have some serious benefits to agriculture. They are a cosmopolitan species of heron, family Ardeidae, found in the tropics, subtropics, and warm temperate zones. The cattle egret maintains a special relationship with cattle, hence its common name, which extends to other large grazing mammals. Wider human farming is believed to be a major cause of their sudden and incredibly fast expanded range. This gracious bird removes ticks and flies from cattle and consumes them. This benefits both species. On the other hand, it has been implicated in the spread of tick-borne animal diseases. The cattle egret has undergone one of the most rapid and wide-reaching natural expansions of any bird species in history. It was originally native to parts of southern Spain and Portugal, tropical and subtropical Africa, and humid tropical and subtropical Asia. But by the end of the 19th century, it began expanding its range into southern Africa, first breeding in the Cape province in 1908. Cattle egrets were first sighted in the Americas on the boundary of Guyana and Suriname in 1877, having apparently flown across the Atlantic Ocean, which seems kind of crazy considering how small they are and how long that trip is. In the 1930s, the species is thought to have become established in both North and South America. Number 1. Fox We've all heard the many and valid complaints that farmers have against foxes, but as it turns out, they also have their benefits. It all depends on your point of view, of course, but it's never wise to add value to an animal as they exist outside of human activities and clashes will always happen. It's part of life. Foxes have proven to be quite handy for farmers. They provide excellent vermin control by preying on mice, rats, and pigeons that may be detrimental to the crops. They are also quite good at hunting rabbits, which are difficult to catch and can sometimes become pests to farmers. A study published in the European Journal of Wildlife Research showed that foxes very rarely, if ever, eat the animal feed. And by hunting the creatures that do eat the animal feed, they are making farmers save money, literally. Also, they are darn cute, and it's always a joy to spot them in the wild. Not only are they a great ally on the countryside, but also in urban areas. They run a free litter cleanup service by eating discarded food thrown away by, well, by us. As you can see, all animals have different qualities that can be useful for many different things. What about you? Which species has been your sworn enemy, and how did you manage to solve your issue? Tell us about it. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time!